Thank you, Toh. So uh, let's get started. Uh, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you've joined in from. Uh, my name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Um, Consolidon is new age in the sense that we did not take the traditional consulting firm model to grow our practice. Instead, what we did, so a traditional consulting firm hires a lot of consultants and put them, uh, puts them on consulting projects. We instead partnered with a lot of subject matter experts, subject matter experts like Imran, who's going to be uh, hosting, the, hosting the webinar today. And uh, this model of working with subject matter experts rather than traditional consultants helped us grow very quickly. Um, in 20, uh, we set up in 2017, by the end of 2019, we were already 500 consultants. We'd already delivered about, um, about 200 consulting projects across the GCC region where we operate. Um, we decided in 2020 uh, that we're gonna spend at least 20% of our capacity in giving back or in uh, supporting other businesses to get back on track after, after the initial shock of COVID-19. Uh, so last year, for example, we got about 700 business leaders from across our region to help small businesses and micro businesses because they were the ones who were suffering the most at the first. Uh, so there's a project called the Superheroes Project. This year, what we decided to do was with about 70 of the boutique firms in our ecosystem, we decided that we're going to um, put together this web summit, a seven day web summit. Today is actually the last day, day seven of this web summit. Uh, where we will, uh, our 70, 75 subject matter experts will have panel discussions, webinars, workshops to pass on expertise in sp different subject areas uh, to, to our audience. So we've had more than 1,500 participants over the last six days. Uh, so really looking forward to this last day. Uh, this is the second discussion that we're having today. It's, uh, like I said, led by Imran. Couple of quick housekeeping points. Uh, feel free to interact during this discussion. Uh, you know, we've uh, we've made it possible for you to unmute yourself, switch on your videos, and interact with us during the discussion. So please do feel free to ask questions on the chat, uh, raise your hands, uh, and ask questions as well. And look out for certain giveaways in the uh, in the chat as well. So, for example, we're doing a workshop in the evening today. It's from 5 to 8 p.m. Dubai time. We're doing giveaways as well. For example, that's a paid workshop, but for three people who are attending this uh, webinar, uh, you can attend that for free as an example. So look out for a form to complete for that. We're inviting speakers for the next edition of Connected Insights. So feel free to uh, you know enroll yourself as a speaker as well. So that's about it from me, Imran. Sorry for taking a little bit longer than I promised I would. Uh, I will pass on to you and I'm looking forward to your session. Uh, great, Varun. Thank you so much. No, it's always a delight to hear you speak. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hope everyone is very excited as much as we are about today's session because today we are going to learn something amazing, something that is very, very close to our heart, which is how to increase your hiring success to above 90 percent uh this is you know your your ability to hire uh successfully is one of the defining skill for you as you climb up the ladder and also as a business owner there is there is not any other skill that is more important for you as you climb up the ladder than your ability to hire successfully and hire top performers so, uh, so here we are, and you know, let me give you a quick introduction about myself because uh, you got to know why you should listen to this gentleman uh, and how I am qualified to talk about this topic. So, uh, my name is Imran Yusuf. Uh, I, I got my undergraduate from one of the top business school in Turkey. Later on, I attended uh, an MBA at Manchester Business School. I'm a member of British Society of Psychology. <clears throat> and I am also a certified senior human resources professional by Society of Human Resources Management. <clears throat> I, wear, I wear a few hats, 
Uh, I'm a board member, advisor, and leadership uh, coach to some of the startup and C-suite in some of the top businesses here in the region. I've uh, founded, co-founded few businesses, and uh, uh, and right now I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Rethink uh, Rethink HR. <clears throat> the ride has not always been very smooth for me. Uh, I had to start from from, from at the bottom of the co corporate ladder, pumping gas uh, at the gas station, uh, mopping at 7-Eleven and distributing a newspaper 4 a.m. in the morning, right? Uh, uh, in New York, working 18 hours a day. So it has never been easy. Uh, and you know, I made myself up to the C-suite uh, of some of the top organization uh, in US, Europe and Middle East. Uh, Recently, before I founded Rethink HR, I was the head of Middle East for one of the world's top 10 leadership advisory firm called N2 Growth, where we advise uh, Fortune 500 on C-suite placement and, and executive coaching based out of UAE. Uh, I've, been, I've, been, I've been a very curious student of, uh, a, of, of success. And, and you know, right when I was young, and I remember when I was a teenager, I was always curious what makes some people successful and other don't. And that that search has led me to not about five reading 500 books on psychology, science of human performance, and self and self development. I've interviewed over 10,000 people, and I. And, 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 I, and I interviewed around 10,000 people and I asked them, hey, what makes you successful? What are you guys doing that we are not doing, right? And I've also attended numerous courses at some of the top business schools like Harvard, London Business School and Wharton. Finally, uh, uh, you know, I have placed uh, and coached about uh, more than 100 uh, board members, C-suite, VP and directors. So organizational engage us as an executive search consultant to help them find, attract, and assess uh, top talent for you where the, stake, where, where the stakes are highest. So that's about a quick introduction about myself. And at Rethink HR, we have a dream, just like Martin Luther King. Uh, and our, our dream is to help create HR, the, uh, a workplace where the coworkers are more excited about their work week than they are about their weekends. I mean, guys, you know, all the frustration and pressure that we feel at the workplace, it doesn't have to be that way. This is, this is all human creation and we can recreate it because you and I, we know very well that when we are happy and excited, we go on to create some amazing, amazing things in our life. It's not other way around that we create things and then we'll be happy. You know, the, the moment when we are happy, when, when we are in that state of zone, we go on to create great stuff. And, you know, we spend more than what, half, half of our wake up time at corporate world. And I think, you know, uh, we can make it better. We can really make it better. Uh, but how are we planning to do that, do that in, uh, at Rethink HR is by helping HR transform from the traditional HR to the agile HR. I mean, post COVID, uh, I think uh, there is no time for HR to sit at the back seat. It's time for them to come on the front seat and take on the steering wheel. Uh, we, we have seen it in, in the COVID, you know, how important is an HR role? Uh, they have to come up, take up the responsibility, take up the challenge and, and stand up to the task. And so what we do is, uh, you know, with those HR people who really believe in that transformation, they really believe in the HR, we, we, we give them the, the required processes, expertise and knowledge required for them to transform that uh, their organization. Uh, and our mission is uh, to help raise the standards of HR in the region today. And today this session, as Varun said, is our, uh, is, is our giving back to the society, helping them raise the standards uh, on such an important topic, how to increase your success rate to above 90%. Uh, no one, uh, I mean, we are not taught, taught about it in the school. Uh, very few training programs that I've attended really tackle the issue uh, and discuss things that are really important. 
uh, and, and to be honest, the C-suite headhunter, really they are making uh, an arm and a leg to, to provide the services to the corporate world that they wanna keep the secret uh, to close to their heart. And you know, we believe in sharing and here we are today, we are sharing, we're gonna learn, you're gonna learn a lot of stuff today that you can take away and immediately increase your, your success rate of hiring above 90%. Uh, there was there was a, a a survey done with the CEOs. First of all, you know we need to establish the importance of hiring and and people. And there was a survey done for CEOs, and they were asked, "What are your biggest challenges?" And these are some of the top CEOs around the world. Uh, and the finding was very very surprising. They have mentioned around about fourteen challenges that keep up to keep them awake at night. If you notice in the purple bar, more than 50% of their challenges are talent related. And even more surprising, if you look at that, four out of their top five challenges are talent related. You know, and these are the CEO of the top organizations. You think that they, were, they, 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 they must be doing great at hiring, managing, developing their people. I mean, an, an organization is only good as people. I mean, as you grow up, the, as you grow in your, in, your, in your business, as you grow in your, uh, in your career, nothing is more important. No more is your intelligence, your strategies, your product. The most important thing is, do you, do you know how to hire the top people and do you, know, do you know how to manage them? Let's go through some of the shocking numbers in terms of the cost of mishires. Uh, because unfortunately, when we go to the financial statement uh, in our organization, there is no column, there is no line that says cost of mishire. This has not been calculated. And unfortunately, a lot of us think that we are great at it. But let's look at the fact, the, the, the validated surveys and, and numbers that are available. Mid-managers with the base salary of $100,000 the average cost of mishire is 15 times their base salary, $1.5 million. Can you imagine that? And this is, this we are talking about mid-managers. What about the senior managers? At senior level, it becomes extremely, extremely costly, uh, the mishires and the bad hires. There are a couple of other uh, researches as well you know, one, one of them uh, identified the cost of bed hire as $240,000. And yet the others are saying that each, each mishire cost you somewhere around $25,000 to $50,000, which is again, huge, right? But it's not, but again, I still, I still, I still believe that the cost of mishire is, is hugely underestimated. And actually it is not even estimated, but there are some people like the CEO of Zappos, you know, who, who monitor that and who understand the value. And he has estimated that the bad hire had cost his company well over $100 million. Again, another research by Gallup that says that the mishire and low performance cost the economy, US economy each year, 450 to $550 billion. So um, I don't know about you guys, but you know, for us, it's so clear that you know, your organization, the economy is only good as the people. And it's all about assessing the people properly because you know, God have created us with all different strengths and weaknesses. And a lot of underperforming people are actually top performers somewhere else, but they are not being assessed properly. Uh, they have been not put in the right seat, uh, so to speak. And then when you hire the bad, Bad hires, you know, it's not only their salaries, right? It's the lost productivity, yes, true, but it's also the impact on the employee morale. I mean, you, some of us, I'm sure that you know, we are we're all senior and we have all worked with some of the colleagues that were uh, that were underperformers, and it really affected us badly. So it really impacted the morale of the of the employees, the lost time, and the replacement cost. It's huge. Uh, I'm going about it again and again, talking about bad hire and cost because really we, we, we don't bring this to our forefront. We don't really focus about it. Uh, a Harvard study suggests that 80% of employee turnover, 
can be attributed to mistakes during the hiring process. So do you see guys, I mean, 80% of employee turnover, all that turnover can be avoided if we, if we, if we do this hiring right. PwC interviewed around over 1,000 CEOs in 85 countries, and they admitted, the CEOs, that 46% of all hires deemed failure in 18 months. And as we said, bad hires have effect on the performance and, uh, and, and the productivity of the organization. Just to reinstate the importance of people, uh, I'm sure some of you have gone through this amazing book, Good to Great by Jim Collin. Uh, what a research. Uh, it was, it was an I, I think it's, it's been a decade now, huh? time, time flies really. So uh, Jim, Jim, what he did is he, he, he assessed over 1,000, it's like 1,400 companies, and he assessed their performance for 40 years. These are, these are the top companies performing around the world. And, and he put some very, very strict criteria to select the top among the top. So this is seriously the cream de la cream of corporate world around the world. And it turned out that there were 11 qualifier based on his, based on his, quali based on his qualifications. And in the book, he goes on to find out what differentiate these 11 top companies compared to all the rest. And by the way, I'm talking about the rest, but I can assure you that those, if you take the top 100, they're like super amazing by itself. But these guys were like, they were the crown on top of that. And then he studies and he said, you know, he, he looked into what really differentiate and he brought that differentiated down to six things that they do differently uh, than, than, than other companies. And these are the six things. Number one was level five leadership. Number two, getting the right people on the bus. And number three, confront, uh, confront the brutal fact, hedgehog concept, culture of discipline and technology accelerator. But again, if you notice, the top two differentiator are people differentiator. It's about the leadership and it's about getting the right people on the bus and off the bus and in the right seat, as, as Jim says. Finally, uh, again, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Brad Smart, uh, who have written a book called Top Grading and they have an amazing methodology on, on top grading the companies. Uh, actually, Brad was engaged by Jack Walsh back in the days at General uh, Electrics, uh, and uh, Jack was very keen on, you know, getting his hiring, his hiring, uh, and his and his people uh, as as the top performers. So these guys, what they did is they went on and they assessed 150 companies, and they did an in-depth interview for these companies, trying to analyze the quality of the people in the organizations. And they found out that 25% of the people in these companies were A, a player or A potential. 50% of them were B players and 25% were C players. So if you notice, 75% of the managers were underperformer, mishire, or straightforward mistakes. That's a huge number, and it's a very, very validated research done by Brad. And you know, some of our things that we are great, right? And these are some of the great companies, and this is what's going on inside them. So where do we stand here in the Middle East? And make no mistake, hiring performing, uh, high performing managers are an astounding 800% more productive to average performer. This was a study done by McKinsey and Company, and this is applicable in companies where it's a, uh, it's a little, it, you know, the, the environment is the more complex, is, is a little bit more complex. It's not rudimentary, uh, you know, uh, companies, but the companies is like consulting and what have you. There, the high performing manager are 800% more productive than average. Yes, this is very shocking. It was hard for me to believe. And I went and I looked into their research and I was convinced that this is true. So this is how important it is, guys. It's people, people, and people, but more importantly, high performance people that we like to call A player. So I hope that you, that I, I, I'm able to impress upon you uh, the importance of people uh, in our organization and the huge cost 
uh, if we if we take it lightly or we don't do it right or we don't learn how to do it right uh, if there is any question i'm happy to please feel free to unmute yourself uh, and and pose it if you have any comments uh, we would love to make it a little bit engaging session so please feel free to unmute yourself and you know pose your comment and questions as you please as of now but now yeah, go ahead is there anybody okay so i'm going to move on to the to a very important part so the big question is so we established that the hiring success rate right now is of a player is 25% so the big question is how can we move it to 90% you know as the title of today's session says how you can how you can improve your hiring success rate to go above 90% so the first step that you know a lot of people get wrong is you know whenever there is a vacancy they just go hey you know what we're looking for marketing manager we're looking for ceo we're looking for uh, supply chain director and uh, just bring out the job description from the hr and go right so the first thing is you know whenever you have a vacancy and whenever you're hiring the first thing you have to do is pause and you should you should really think that you know what are we really looking for what are we looking for in a, in, in a potential candidate, right? So there are three basic things. It's very simple. You know, it, it is it is complicated, but it is one of those simplicity at the other side of complexity. So the three questions that you need to ask whenever you're looking for someone is, can he do the job? Will he do the job? And can we work together? This is this is really you should always be put this in your dashboard and always you know whenever you assess people you have to always this at, at the back of your mind. Can he do the job? Does the candidates have the competencies, skills, and capabilities, experience, education to do the job? I.e., can he deliver the deliverables of the of the position? That's number one. Number two is will he do the job? Does he have the motivation? Right. A lot of time you know our clients. You know, ask us to find somebody who is from the same industry, uh, in the same location, and who have done the same thing, right? And and the, and the question that I ask is, you know, this uh, the person who have been there and done that. What is his motivation level? I mean, because we are talking about senior managers, so they are like 40 plus, right? Somebody in his 45, 50s, and you ask him to, hey, you know what? What the same thing you have done for the last three years? Come and do that for us. Right? Uh, how how really motivated that person would be to spend three years of his precious time in his early forties or fifties and and do the same thing for you, right? And then finally, the most you know very very important is can we work together? Which is you know uh, uh, does his values and his personality is a match with our culture fit? Uh, so what are what are we looking for? And let me remind you that the role and people are means to an end. And a lot of a lot of us forget that. Whenever we are looking for people, we say, hey, you know what, we're looking for education, this bachelor degrees, 10 years of experience, and you know, what have you. And we always you know, we kind of take the eyes off the ball and we don't you know consciously understand that you know what we are actually we, who wants to fill a vacancy just to see a person the reason we are filling the purpose is it's a means to an end so it's always it's always about business growth so you should always always keep in mind that no matter what role you are hiring he or she or the role should contribute to the business growth you should always have the business objective in mind and this is where I'm a huge opponent of the JDs versus CVs. You know, everybody's like, they're matching JDs from a database from the CVs. And I always say, focus on deliverables, deliverables. That position exists because it, this position has some deliverables, some concrete result that it has to produce towards the growth of the organization. You, you might think that this is something small, but guys, this is really big. It really changes. It, it gives you a completely new uh, glasses, eyeglasses to look at the world. If you focus on deliverables and you go out and look for the candidate, 
It's a completely different way, the way you're going to screen. Then the guy didn't have, I don't know what, he didn't have exactly the seven years of experience. He doesn't have, uh, you know, five years experience in Saudi Arabia, or he's not coming from in this industry. All of it will become irrelevant. He doesn't have a bachelor degree, whatever. So the moment you start focusing on deliverables, you, you're going to start seeing things a little bit differently. So once again, whenever you start your search, you have to revise, you have to rethink, you have to bring to your conscious that what was the, what's the vision of the business, what were the goals, and what are the objectives of, of your business. And also very important, you have to also see at the what business stage is your organization at in, in terms of the growth curve. Is it at a startup? Is it at a maturity? Is it at the growth and decline? Now, let me give you an example. You know, the job description of a marketing manager for all these four stages will look exactly the same. Increase the market share, do the marketing, increase the brand awareness, right? But I can assure you that the marketing manager that would be successful in each and every of these states is completely different. That's why I, I don't believe in job description because that doesn't, doesn't really tell you, you know, what you're looking for. And you have to also connect that. You, you also have to keep your strategy in mind. You know, you, every person you bring, it has, to, it, has to, it has to produce, it has to connect with that strategy. Uh, your strategy, as a, are you a price leader? Are you, are, you on, are you a cost optimizer? Are you an expansion mode? Or you're, you're in an innovation mode? All of this is going to make a lot of difference in terms of what kind of person you're looking for. You also have to uh, be conscious about the competition landscape. One of the clients that we are working with, uh, they, they have, uh, they're looking for a CEO uh, and they used to have a monopoly uh, in, in their business. And the government have decided that they want, to, they want all the players to start entering that industry. And now it's gonna quickly become very saturated. All the big players, other big players are entering the market. So they're asking us to find a CEO and this CEO so they're asking us to find a CEO who can come from a very, very competitive environment because before they used to have monopoly, the business was not that efficient, there's restructuring, there was no, no urgency there. So now they want a CEO who is coming from a very, very competitive environment, uh, somebody who have done major transformation, restructuring, and help the organization go to uh, an IPO. So you see how, how the competition landscape can help you define what you're looking for. It's also important for you to look at the team mix and the leadership style, very, very important. I mean, uh, again, this is not available in the job description. You, you have to have that in mind, the, the personality and the leadership style of the boss. And if, it is, if you are hiding that, you have to understand your leadership style and you also have to understand your team mix. What kind of, uh, what kind of team do you have? Do you have creators who are, who are creative? Do you have implementers? What do you need? Do you need coordinators? What is, what is missing in your team? So you have to also make sure that the person you're looking for is a good fit and he bring a complete and, and different set of competencies with them. And again, you know, uh, there is no uh, undervaluing the culture. Uh, the person you have to always keep in mind what's the culture of your organization? Is it caring authority? Is the organization control freak? Is this a learning culture? Is this fun and open culture? Is it a very serious result driven culture or is it a purpose driven, driven culture? So as I said, for me, the most important thing is our deliverables. You know, everything else can be understood if you know exactly what you want the person to deliver. And of course, with the deliverables, you have to understand the challenge. If the challenges are, are bigger, then you're gonna bring somebody else. If the challenges are less, you know, uh, uh, tough, then you might wanna bring somebody else. So deliverables, challenges, and obviously the competencies, which are skills, uh, attitude, uh, um, and, uh, and knowledge of the person. So you have to, you have to list them down as, as well. But you also have to think about, so this is, this is your thinking from your side. What about, you also have to have a outside in approach. You got to think from outside in, which is why would anyone want to work with you? You got to think about who is my ideal candidate and where is he, what is he doing right now? Where is he? You have to start thinking about the ideal candidate, his thought process, uh, and why would he ever join you? And then you have to think about how can you attract them? And why would anybody want to work with you with, in your company? And why would anybody want to work with you as a boss? 
this is a very, these are very, very important questions that you have to ask yourself uh, before you go in your search for the, for the candidate. Usually people are driven by the company, company reputation, challenge, future growth, the personality of boss, and, and salaries, right? These are, these are like top five things that any candidate think about whenever an, an opportunity is introduced to them. They think about the company reputation, how big, uh, how well known is the company, what are the reputation. Uh, they, they think about the challenge, very, very important. You know, uh, the candidate, they think about the challenge at hand. So what's the challenge? Well, why is it so exciting? Why should I join? What I will be doing? What I'm expected to do? Uh, they are very keen on, uh, will I be able to grow uh, in this organization? Uh, the personality of the boss is very important for anybody joining the organization. You and me, we have been in this position, right? And the money. But at the same time, let's not forget, uh, you know, the, the, the Daniel Pink, uh, when he said that people are driven by three things, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Because once you know what ticks people, then you will be able to attract them. Then you will be able to understand the world from their perspective. Uh, following that, what you need to do is you need to create a, a, a target list, right? So you understand what you're looking for. You know who you're looking for. You understand your selection criteria. Now the next step is you gotta, you gotta come up with the, the, your target list. So you need to put down all the list of companies that you think this candidate is working with right now. A lot of people immediately, they go to database, uh, CV search and what have you. The first thing you gotta keep your focus because when you go to your network and you go to databases, you are, you will, you're more likely to get people who are, who are jobless, who are actively looking for job. And unfortunately, very few of the time, those people who are actively looking for the job turn out to be top performers. Your top performer uh, is somebody who is right now working in his company, very excited, very pumped up, uh, achieving his goals. And he has no time to apply for the job post or put his CV in the databases and update that. So for you to make sure that you don't miss, you, you are not only entertaining people who are coming to you who are looking for job, but then you are going through them and looking for the people who are passive and who are top performer. Because you know, no matter how good is your assessment, if you are not bringing in top quality people within your assessment, then your assessment is not gonna help. If you have the best assessment in the world, but your pipeline doesn't have the quality candidate, then you will end up compromising, right? So you have to have the list of companies that you think that this candidate might be working right now and he has worked with, uh, followed by, uh, you put down the titles because every organization have different titles. So you can think about, hey, you know what? For example, uh, you're looking for a chief, uh, let's say a chief commercial officer. The title could be VP sales and marketing. It could be national sales manager, uh, country head sales. All of these you know, fit into that titles. So don't be uh, misguided by, by different titles. Uh, look, for, look for the responsibilities. And then you populate the names, you know, thank God that we have LinkedIn before LinkedIn, we used to work and it was so difficult to, uh, it was so difficult to uh, uh, find, find those names uh, uh, in, in the, in, in the uh, from, from, from uh, different sources. So right now, thank God we got LinkedIn so we can, we can find that uh, right away. But I would recommend that you should have at least 50 uh, names of, of the candidates that will, that will help you really produce some good shot list and then you know assess them well and and pull out one or two top top candidates and then you have to figure out the way to approach approach these candidates but before you approach it's very very important that you do a good research on the potential candidate yes before you even approach them you have to do the research now the people whenever they think of assessing and hiring they always focus on the interview part but there is so much information available, so much opportunity for you to assess and understand person during the whole process. And I think we are really uh, losing that opportunity by delegating it to the junior, jun junior staff who's really, you know, they are the JDs matching the CVs guys, right? So I would highly recommend that, you know, most of the decision makers that they do, the C-suite guys, they do this themselves because I mean, 
hiring one C level, we already understand now what's the cost of mishiring guys. So this is, I think, one of the most important tasks. If you're a CEO, if you're a chairman, if you're a board member, your most important responsibility is to bring the right people on board, right? And you know, we spend hours and hours on uh, on board preparing ourselves for board meetings, doing business plan, and you know the thing that is that is really the most important. We just spend what, you know, we spend like one hour, two hour, hardly on interviewing the guy. So you got to research the guy before you you approach him. You got to read each and every word what is what is mentioned in the LinkedIn profile, for example. You got to look at his education. You got to research the company that he has worked with. Go look them in the news, go to their people section, look at their team, look at the boss profile that this person is reporting to, look at the, some of the responsibility of his, of his reportees that will give you a good idea about what is his really his responsibilities. Pay special attention to the transition uh, and his tenures and how he has been progressing. Uh, look at if the people are recommending him and what they are saying about him, look at his post or her post uh, and you know that will it will it will now it's very important guys that you know when you go and you assess people you have to put your researcher hat and researcher they never jump to conclusion they go step by step the first step is to collect the data don't analyze the data as as it's coming don't jump to conclusion get more and lot a lot of information and then once you collect that then you analyze that data with all the other data that you have, and that will make, help you make the right picture of the person. Uh, then let's say you, 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 you've done a good research, now it's time for you to approach the candidate. Yes, I'm going into these details because these details matter. And this is where the lost opportunity is. This is where we have the opportunity to increase our success rate. Uh, you might want to approach the candidate through a LinkedIn message or an email. And it, it could be a very simple message says, hey, you know what, I came across your profile. Uh, I think we have an opportunity that might be of interest to you. Shall we, can we, can we, do you, would you like to explore the opportunity with us over a phone call? Make sure you was to use the word explore. A lot of people are like, you know, we have this opportunity, here's the job description, are you interested, right? So the big guys, they, they really, uh, if you use the word exploring, they are, they are more prone to, uh, to, to coming and talking to you. So once you do that and you go on the first call, this is very important and a lot of people are not doing this. On the first call, you are more of a salesman than an assessor. Yes, you, you assess, you know, 25% of the time you're gonna assess the candidate, what is he saying and what's not but really 75% of that focus on that first call as a friendly call, introducing the opportunity and let's explore it together kind of attitude. And in this call, you give them a good brief about the company, about the position and deliverables. Let's say this call is half an hour. So spend 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes talking about the company, talking about the position and, and, and really what is expected of this you know the moment you share the deliverables you're already you're already among the top 10 percent because a lot of people when you talk a lot of candidates that i talk to they, they are like very surprised they said hey imran you know nobody ever tell us what is the first year deliverable what do they want to have delivered uh, by 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 the candidate now once you introduce the opportunity now here's the thing this is the reason i want you as a ceo chairman board member whatever right to do to make this call yourself because when you introduce the opportunity it's first of all there's no one better to introduce the opportunity than you right uh, the people down there i talk to them and they don't even know the company the business what investment for example there was a company and we, they were looking for chief investment officer and you ask the junior people okay can you tell me what kind of investments this company have made in the past no answer they don't know they don't know what alternative investment is. They don't know uh, what's private equity is and they're looking for the candidates. So you can imagine what kind of impression this candidate is getting uh, about your company. So that's why I will highly encourage you, the decision maker to pick up the phone and talk to the guy himself. It's, it's, very, it's very, very important. And now when you introduce the opportunity, now this, you have to be very, very cautious about 
what kind of questions the candidate ask you right after during your when you're sharing the opportunity the candidate must be asking you some question and that question will tell you a lot about the candidate how he thinks what is important to him is is are, are his questions related to company or is it related to people or is it related to the task or the challenge at hand or is it is it related to hey you know what what the position is going to pay you see guys we are missing such an important opportunity to assess the candidate and to understand his thinking and what is what motivates him by by delegating these calls to the junior people you know and you you are the decision maker you know the company you have so much experience you can evaluate the person right then and there if this is the right person uh, who fit the criteria that we have set earlier but also don't miss the opportunity to ask very very important very very selective few question that will tell you a lot about the candidate so i always ask them that hey you, you so i have shared the opportunity let me know what's your initial reaction what do you think about the opportunity just have your raw initial reaction again a great opportunity to understand you know how interested the person really is and what are his thought about the pro, about, about the opportunity second very important question i always ask is let's say you know before this call what were you thinking about your career what where are you in your career today and where are you heading again very very important question right and uh, then you need to ask him that you know uh, hypothetically if this is an interesting opportunity for you uh, why would you move and when you ask this question what you want to see is what are their pull factor and what are their push factors very very important when you go in and you negotiate and you put their 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 package and their job offer all of this going to help you so much to make sure that you get that a player on board because you already know his pain points and his pleasure points so you got to ask him what what you don't like about your current company and you got you, you got to ask him nicely right because and that's where if you spend good 20 minutes about introducing the opportunity give him an opportunity to ask the question and let him respond uh, then he will be ready to share that with you you have already made the you have already built the relationship uh, you have already you know uh, built up some rapport hopefully so now you ask him hey you know i know you are you're in a great great place you are you're excited about what you're doing but let me ask you what would be some of the things that you are not very happy or very satisfied in your current role right Th that's the push you know if if they don't have this they will take a job offer and they will they will never come they will not show up so that's why you have to really make sure that there is enough pain point enough push for them there and at the same time you got to ask them hey what do you look for in your next challenge what are you excited about and that's the poll and again whenever you are talking to the candidate and assessing you're always matching it to your requirements and your culture uh, and your fit you're you're doing this fit analysis if this guy is fitting the role or not uh finally when you close the call uh yes we are going to details you see that's the because you know really uh, the success is in the details guys you know and, and and the way you treat the candidate the way you respect him the way you communicate it's super super important because if you are after the a player then a player are completely different animal top performer are completely different animal than than your average joe they think differently they feel differently they care for each and everything uh and and especially how you treat them so once you close the call say hey you know what i'm going to send you some you know the company website the profile if you have i'm going to send you the linkedin profile my linkedin profile or the profile of uh, the hiring authority i'm going to throw across some documents of role and responsibility and if you like what you see then kindly you know send back your uh, send, send back your updated cv and and let them take the sweet time this is very important no need to follow up if the if they are really into this and they're really serious about it they're going to come back with their updated cv and this is again you know a, a gauge for your motivator is the guy motivated enough the sooner you send your cv there's a little bit of indicator of the guy is really serious and he's excited about this opportunity and finally when you receive the cvs guys at least send them a thank you message right okay now we are going into one of the most important part of this session the assessment uh is there any other question any comments 
any suggestion, any ideas that, that any one of you like to share so far? Yeah, uh, Imran, uh, Tasneem Haris, Rahan. Yes, please, Tasneem, can you please unmute yourself and uh, ask a question or comment? Hello, greetings of the day, Mr. Imran. Do you hear me? Yes, Alvaro, I hear you loud and clear. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Lovely, lovely. I have some issues with the microphone. That's why I couldn't uh, uh, thank you at the beginning of the seminar. Thank you so much anyway. You're most welcome. I have a question. I mean, because obviously you're approaching this uh, for obviously the top performers normally. They have um, employment. I mean, they're working for uh, somebody else. But uh, how would you approach uh, uh, this first call? I mean, obviously, with someone who's unemployed, which, I mean, in this case, especially with COVID ongoing, um, I mean, we see actually, um, uh, I mean, I'm very into uh, LinkedIn, and I see very good profiles, actually, who are unemployed uh, for reasons that are, are uh, actually out of their hands. So how do you approach this? Because, um, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> they have the motivation, obviously, to find a job. So it's something that, I mean, it's on the nature of a, you know, of a professional, obviously they need to, to feed their families and to, you know, and to, and to survive. So how we can really see besides that need is the, the, you know, the interest and the motivation of the, of the candidate to, to, to be the right candidate for the job. Right, right. So uh, in terms of the candidate doing, being the right, the beef will come in the assessment part. You know, once we go through assessment, you really understand that more. But, you know, uh, usually the way we go about it is, you know, whenever we create that list of people, then, you know, we look, if, if we know somebody who can introduce us to that person, that's always the best because the warm introduction is always better than a cold one. But if you don't have any other option, then, you know, you just send them a message through LinkedIn or if you have their email, you send them an email, hey, you know, I, I came across your profile, uh, looks very interesting. Uh, I would like to discuss an opportunity with you. Uh, are you willing to explore? And then, you know, once he responds, you just take on from there. Uh, uh, and then, you know, step by step, right? It's a step-by-step step step process, you know. And end of the day, it's the candidate, you know, it's, you, you can't do this thinking. You can't overthink about it. Your job is to introduce the opportunity in the best way possible. So what I'm saying is, let's do what is in our control. Approach as many people, relevant people as possible, be the best communicator that we can. We don't want to oversell, we don't want to undersell. And we do our job, and then it's, you, you leave the candidate, and the, and the way he respond to you, the way he react, the question he ask, is he, is he, will, and he will tell you, yes, I'm interested, or I'm not interested as well, right? Does that answer your question, or? Uh, yeah, you, you yeah, yeah. Something? it does, it does. Thank you, Mr. Imran. Okay, Alvaro, nice to have you. Thank you, pleasure. Uh, the cinema is she, is she yes. able to unmute? Or? Yeah, Imran. Hi. I yeah, hope you hi. can hear me now. Yeah, hi, the same. Yeah, I can hear hi, you very well. Good. good morning. Thank you very much. Um, it was it is really a great session. I would like to ask you about uh, the best assessment that you said. Uh, are you going to cover in this upcoming one? Because this question was asked earlier when you were on that point at, actually, in the right. pre-approach. Yeah. Right. So, what do you mean by best assessment according to you? Right, right. So uh, assessment will, will, will cover now this. And if you still have the question, then you can really bring it up. Happy to answer that. Sure, we'll do. Thank All right, you. Tasneem. Happy to have you. Any other question, comment? Yeah, Kanan here. Hey, Kanan, how are you? Yeah, doing good. Uh, just have a you know, base question here. No, uh, you, we've been saying that, you no, know, you said 25% would be high performance and the balance 75 would be like medium performance and low performance. Right. Now, uh, uh, how can we expect the entire, say, from 25%, how can we increase the numbers to 75% when only 25% are like high performance? Right, right. It's 25% across the industry are high performance. Now, is it, does it mean to say that uh, we expect all candidates or students or employees need to be high performers or should should it, should the rest of the 75 percent may increase the percentage of you know medium performance performers to be increased as high performance right right very good question I, I understand I understand your question very good question 
So uh, I, I do understand what you're trying to say is that there will always be limited number of high performers. You know, because you know, end of the day, we are we are a population. In the population, you have good and and, and what have you. Uh, you know, the, the definition of high performance, uh, Karan, is somebody who is uh, who is at the top ten percent of 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 the job of the position, right? And and you have a, a performer. A high performer doesn't mean that he is you know you know he's only at a C level. You have high performer at all at all the levels, right? Mm -hmm. And your and my role is. To increase that percentage, because you know we care about our company and our organization most. So, our role is once we understand who are the top performer, what are their qualities, what are their capabilities, and then we know how to assess them. Our role is to increase that percentage, and the research and and uh, and and, ex and business cases have proven there are organizations that have a, were able to increase in the whole company. They had a top performer at. 90% plus, but it's a, it's a long process. It's a long process. Once you start today, once you understand now this, it's a long process for you. I would say that within 18 months, uh, you know, uh, minimum, that you will be able to slowly, slowly replace the, the, the bad performers, bring that culture of high performance. And you know, you know, the, the, you know, the interesting thing is once you start at the top level of the organization, right? And you start bringing the top performers there, you know, top performer, they know who they are and they, they can feel the top performer. So once you bring them, they have high standards and they will start bringing the people underneath them. And slowly, slowly, you will have the, 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 the culture of performance and things will change. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Okay, great, great question, Kanan. So I got to move on. We got limited time because this is the beef of this presentation. Now, so these are, these are the list of you know, uh, of each and every one of predictor for the performance of the job. I know this is a long list. Uh, so what we did is we made it, we made it uh, in, a, in a smaller uh, format so that you can easily understand. So these are the predictors and this is how good they are in predicting the job performance, right? And if you noticed here, the interest, the education, the job experience, uh, and unstructured interviews that most of the companies focus on, they are really the worst indicators of job performance. And if you look at the talent acquisition department of all the organization, this is what they focus on. The job experience, the years of experience, the education, uh, and, and, and interviews are usually, I mean, at least in my experience, it's like 70% unstructured. Hence, there is no surprise that you know we are getting only 25% success rate, because the, the 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 predictive measures that we are use, that we are using is very very low in validity, right? And that's where you know I'm gonna next slide is about the winning formula. What what you should what uh, measure what uh, uh, tools that you should use that will help you increase that success rate from 25 to 90. So here, if you can see the structured interviews are up there. Here you can see general ability test, uh, tests are up there uh, and, and personality assessment. So let me share with you the winning formula. This is both based on my experience and also hundred of courses, training program that I've attended. If you want to improve your hiring success rate, then you have to uh, embrace this formula. The first thing is psychometric assessment. Uh, and in the psychometric assessment, when you once when you when you do psychometric assessment, it gives you an idea about the cognitive ability, which is we said the ability tests to have are very high indicators of, of success. It tells you about the personality of the candidate and it tells you about the motivation of the candidate. The number two is are the structured interviews, not unstructured, but structured interviews, and we go in a little bit details there uh, in a minute. And and then finally, uh, and then finally the reference. So these three things mainly, of course, it's very important how you manage the whole process, but these are the three main tools that you have to increase your success rate. And this is usually how much weightage I give uh, in my assessment, psychometric assessment, 25%, reference check, 25%, and structured interview, uh, 40%. 40%.
Let's go. Uh, so in terms of psychometric assessment, uh, the time is not allowing. Otherwise, I had the report and I can show you. Uh, uh, I can I can show you that you know how much information we can get about a candidate in, in a psychometric assessment. Uh, let me do it very quickly here. Let, let me try to show it to you guys. Hold on. Because there was some question regarding the psychometric assessment, so this is this is one of the assessment. There are there are quite few good ones out there, but this is this is the one we use, uh, which is uh, SciTech. It's a UK based. Uh, they have done around five million assessment around the world. And just look at the the amount of information you can get about a candidate through a psychometric assessment. And I'm sure most of you do uh, use psychometric assessment. Uh, you look at this. This is a huge twenty page report. And that tells you about the, how the person is uh, when he interact with his team, how is his leadership style, how is he as a subordinate, how is his influencing style, and what kind of career theme that is. Is he a creative guy? Is he a realistic guy? What kind of role that he will be successful in? And most importantly, this 15Q profile, it tells you exactly what the, what, the, what the person is made of. I mean, imagine this kind of information before you go into an interview with a candidate, right? And you see that this guy, for example, is high on intellectual. He's very, very uh, dutiful. He, he, he liked to follow the rules. He's socially bold. And, and, and he is, is a little bit radical. So this guy is gonna usually choose untraditional approach to the things, right? So for example, if I'm looking for an operational, head of operation, I want him somebody who really is a little bit more traditional than radical, because here it's all about structure, system, follow the system, be structured, no compromise there. So a radical guy in an operational uh, environment would not be the best fit. At the same time, if I have a, if I have a creative, I'm, I'm, if I'm adding for a, a creative guy, then I, I want him to be more on the radical side. I want him to be more creative, right? Uh, and the same case is self self discipline and compose. So look at this, you know, there's so much information that, that you can analyze about the candidate before you go uh, in, a, in an interview. But let me just quickly also tell you so that you can really appreciate, let's go through this. This is basically my profile. Let's read, read only this one paragraph. It says, Imran use of interpersonal orientation is on the borderline of extroversion and introversion. Now, usually what happens is when we assess people, we say, oh, this guy is extrovert and introvert. But what about those people who are in the middle, right? We are quick to judge. We are we are very we are very quick to judge on in terms of extreme. So it says falling within this band, he will tend to communicate readily without having a requirement for excessive personal contact. He is as likely to be as happy dealing with people as when occupied with tasks. So I'm somebody who is equally happy with the people and equally happy with the task. There are people who are more people oriented. There are more task oriented. But generally, will come forward in social situation, particularly if this places him at the center of the attention. Expressing moderate level of warmth and empathy is likely to see as relatively support for the colleagues. I mean, this is just one point. Look, look at the level of details that you can get out of, out of uh, a psychometric assessment. Uh, so in the favor of, of time, I'm just gonna switch back uh, to the presentation. So once you, once you know, uh, once, once you have the psychometric assessment done, now imagine the kind of information you have and you're going into an interview. And then again, the psychometric assessment is a report in your hand and you are a doctor. So you got to validate that. So all of this you can validate through, through during the interview. So, so now the next thing is, you know, we talk about the structure, right? We talk about the psychometric assessment, interviews and reference check. Now let's go into the interviews. In terms of interview, what we embrace is something called SIDS interview. I'm sure that very few people in this part of the world know about this, but this was again developed by Brad Smart using a huge study that was initiated by Jack Walsh. And they came up with something called SIDS interview, chronological in-depth structured interviews. So here, what, what you do is, usually you spend good two to three hours with the candidate, yes? Some of you will be raising your brow saying, what, two to three hours per candidate? That's crazy. But guys, this is serious stuff. The mishire cost is really huge. 
So what you do is, now this is, this is a very structured approach and I'm telling you guys, it, like I, I start using this 10 years back and before that I used to go through like everybody else interviews. And once I start using this, I was like, my God, Imran, you've been wasting your whole life. And you, we, I used to think this is a guesswork. Once you go through this process, the candidate will be, all of that information will be right in front of you and you will be able to judge so much easier. So the way it works is, of course, you know, there is like only, only on this SIDS interview, we spend, you know, there's a workshop of two to three days only on SIDS interview, but I'm gonna go over it very quickly. The way it works is you go through the educational background, it's chronological. So it starts from the way it starts and it goes from each and every position and move forward. But most importantly, you focus on the three most recent and relevant experiences. And this is how you go about it. You first thing you ask is, Mr. Candidate, how did you find that opportunity? How was the opportunity introduced to you? And there, that is a huge opportunity for you to understand the thinking of the candidate. Now, he has already left a company and joined another company. And here you have a situation where you want him to leave his company and join your company. So this, if you ask this question that what was, how did you find the opportunity and what was appealing to you, why you left your company and why you joined it, it tells you a lot about the candidate's thinking style, his decision-making ability, uh, what was important to him. And then you go into, so you say, and then you go into what was the role and deliverables of the position that, that, that you were asked. And then you say, when you joined the company, what did you find versus what were your expectations? I.e., what were the challenges when you joined the company? You, you ask about the boss and the team. What, who was your boss? Uh, what about the team? How was the, how was the team? Now, once you understand the context, because why you're doing this? Because you need to understand the context. You can't understand his achievement and his, his, his low points if you don't put it in the context. So you need to understand the company he was joining, what was the environment like, what was his task, what were the challenges, what was the team that he, he in, inherited. Uh, and then you go into asking him, what, this is very important, what were the high points and achievement? What did you achieve in that organization that you're so proud of? And there you use a technique called STAR, which is you ask him, you don't let somebody say, oh, you know what, I, I increased the sales by 200% and profitability by 50%. And then you say, okay, great. So this was, so you ask, what is the situation in task? You really wanna ask what action they took and what was the result? So you say, okay, that's great. Can we, can we rewind back a bit? And can you tell me what was the situation like? What was the sales when you joined the company? What was the profitability like? Uh, and what, did you, what was your plan at the time? What, were you, what you wanted to achieve? and what action you took, and then you link it back to results. So when you do this, and then you ask them, hey, you know what, no, nobody's perfect. What were some of the disappointment? What were some of the low points? What do you think that you could have done better? And then finally, why you left the company. Now, if you do this, you know, this is, this is, there's so much going on inside this, guys, that I cannot cover here. If you do this for three positions, my God, the kind of information that is coming to you is unbelievable. And, and I can assure you that, you know, it's like, you know, other, other, other type of interviews, like, you know, give me an example, tell me a situation where people can make up things. In this situation, people will not be able to make up things because you are going into details. You are not just saying, oh, you know what, we, we had a great year. No, what do you mean by great year? Uh, what was the sales like? What was the sales in the beginning? What was the end? What did you do differently? What were the products look like? You know, so you go into details and you dig deep. And then the guy understand, you know what, in my experience, I've seen that once you do it one time, the guy understand, oh my God, you know, I, I'm not able, I can't trick this guy. He's going into details. And, and then when you do it for the second company, it's easier and the third company is more easier. So you get so much information about the candidate that really it's take out, it take out the guesswork from, 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 uh, from the hiring. Now, while I'm doing this, so this is a this is almost like a storytelling, right? So he's telling you the story. I, you know, I was I, I did my education here. I went to this company. This is what I did. This were the challenges. This was the team like, and then especially with the team, you go in more details. Okay, you inherited this team at that time. What did you do about it? What changes did you make? Did you fire anybody? Did you hire more people? What was your team like when you left? Right. That also tell you about some of the leadership style, and you also ask about what the team think of him and, and what was boss would have think of him if we would if we would talk to his boss. Now, when all of this is going on, at the same time, 
in our background, what we are doing at the same time, we are validating the psychometric assessment. So you're going in that interview with the whole psychometric, whole heap of information about the candidate, his style, his personality, and you are validating. So as he's telling you, you know what kind of person he is, and you kind of interrupt and you, 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 you verify that information. Uh, a lot of people are very much uh, in love with competency-based interviews. I like them, but I'm not a big fan. Uh, I'm okay with it because you know, you know, when you put somebody in front of you, say, hey, you know, give me an example where you you where you, where you show that you were a great team member. I mean, this is a leading question, isn't it? You're already putting him in a situation uh, that you know he has to tell you. That's that's very leading, right? And the guy will come up with either story or I have seen some good people, you know, can't answer that question uh, right away, right? But when you go into a story mode, chronological, one by one. You are helping him tap into his memory, go into that situation, go into that company environment and really start sharing the stuff with you. So what, I, what we do is we have the competency on the back of our mind. Actually, I have that in my notes. And, and, and as he's giving me examples, I'm, I'm ticking the competencies, leadership competency, tick, learning, tick, strategy thinking, tick, right? So I'm doing it at the back of my mind. At the same time, I'm very cognizant of the motivation factors. You see, when the guy leave and when he joined the company and what are the motivators, it tells me a lot about that motivation. Very, very important. You know, the part which is, if the guy is, can he do the job? Will he do the job? The culture fit is extremely important. And then I have a couple of more lists in, in the back of my mind. There are some things that are must for me, no matter the position, no matter the territory, these are must for me when I'm, when I'm interviewing people uh, and if the people don't have that, I, I, I can't qualify them at all. And I also have a list of derailers. Let me share that with you. So the miss, must for me is integrity, discipline, communication skills, emotional intelligence, learning agility, and, and, the, and purpose and goal, and somebody who is bigger than life versus somebody who is only talking about me, me, me. I did it. I was the one. I did that. I had that achievement, right? So integrity, basically, you know, there are so many ways to find out. If somebody, you, you give an opportunity to, to uh, and if, if somebody is bringing up some of his weakness and he's very comfortable about it, he's talking to you very openly, very comfortably, and you know the information he's giving you is detrimental to, to him progressing in this role. And he's, he's very comfortably telling you that you can understand this guy is, you can never be sure 100% about the integrity, but you know that uh, this guy is, is way up there. In terms of discipline, be very conscious about the guy. If, if they will tell you in the story, oh, you know, I'm somebody who early wake up. I wake up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Oh, this guy is, you know, somebody who is really keen, serious, hard worker, and he wakes up early. Communication skills, you're already doing that. Emotional intelligence is very, very important. You know, somebody who have good level of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and social management. Self-awareness is like when you ask somebody, hey, can you tell me a little bit about your, what do you think about your strength or what do you think your weaknesses are? And if he's uh, structuring and he's not, it's like, oh, I don't know about my weakness, you know, and you know, and his list of strength is like 12 points, and he can't remember one or two strength, one or two weakness, and they will come up with my only weakness. Oh, my weakness is I, I work too hard. My weakness is I trust too much, right? So those are the typical answer. So I always say, hey, listen, you know, whenever they're talking about their strength, I say, listen, the longer the list of your strength, the longer would be the list of weakness, right? So this is the must for me, you know, whenever I look in a candidate. So I have that list as well. And then there are a list of derailers. You know, if any, any of these, you know, a candidate has, then it's very, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a huge detriment to his progress in the role. So uh, just few I'll, I'll cover here, for example, over managing, if somebody is very defensive uh, during the conversation, uh, somebody who is uh, who, who's not able to build a team when you ask them, hey, what was the team like when you started and when you left? And then you say, what? You didn't fire anyone? And then you start questioning, hey, what's going on? This guy, can he, can he really pull, pull the trigger when it's needed? Somebody who is too politically savvy or somebody who does it, who's not politically savvy at all. Uh, and, and so this is, this is a long list of things that I want to make sure that the candidate doesn't have that. And finally, uh, the reference check. You know, again, reference check, guys, you know, we can spend a day on this. It's not done right. Uh, the most important thing is that you don't only focus on the references that have been submitted, uh, but you also tell the candidate in, in front that say, hey, listen, you know, we'll be approaching other, other companies as well that you've worked with, not only the references that you have done, and go and talk to them, 
talk to at least three different companies, talk to the boss, talk to the colleagues, HR, direct reporters, and, and also be structured in your question when you ask them. And, uh, and you know, don't build your opinion based on just that. But it's also very important. But you see, guys, you know, if you do this, there's so much information coming to you. In terms of references, there's so much information coming to you. Psychometric assessment, structure interviews. Now you, what you do is you bring all of that together and take as much notes as you can, and then you analyze uh, that, you know, if this, if this person is, is, uh, is among the top or not. Uh, finally, uh, what are some of the common reasons for bad hires? We said that, you know, you know the, there is a huge ratio of bad hires. Uh, a lot of time, we, we, I see that a lot of people have overconfident in their capability of assessing the people. They say, oh, you know what? I can feel it. I got my guts. Guys, hiring is a science, right? And it's a science that has to be learned and developed. Uh, if you have a superiority mindset that, you know, I'm superior, whenever you have a vacancy, you're superior and candidates are inferior who are applying, I can assure you, you never get top performer, never. So unless you change your mindset and you really treat employees as your partners and the candidates with respect, you because you know as I told you, A players are extremely extremely uh, sensitive. Uh, so one of the common mistakes is they never sell the opportunity. You got to sell the opportunity. You know, just because you are uh, you are a company and you have a vacancy doesn't mean that hey, you know, I don't care. Let whoever is interested let them apply. No, it is your responsibility to sell the opportunity to introduce it properly. A uh, lot of time, people have no clue what a player look like, and and you know a player, as I said, is a different animal, and they have a slight of attitude. And why not? Because this guy, these are the people who really take organization from point A to point B, right? They have huge achievement, right? Multi billion dollar sales, partnership, acquisitions, uh, you know, turnaround organization, you know. So these people, when they talk to you, when they come in an interview, and they talk at your level, don't get offended because. Uh, you know these these people have done some great stuff, and I I know that you know uh, it's it's not the bad attitude. It's, it's it's a little bit of confidence that a player. It's very difficult to find an a player who are humble. So whenever you a lot of people are you know they just like whenever they look at somebody they say oh you know what I don't know they're scared they they get scared they say how oh, I'm going to control this guy. Whenever you have this feeling oh my god how I'm going to control this guy, you you have to tell inside maybe I have an a player sitting in front of me. Uh, Talent acquisition process, you know, the, the normal talent acquisition process of the companies, A players are allergic to it. The junior people calling them, asking them stupid question, there's nothing that puts, puts them off more than filling the forms and, you know, asking those stupid questions which are already there in their CVs. Uh, and a lot of time, you know, uh, people are rely on active candidates who are looking for opportunities uh, within the databases. Top performer, as I said, they don't sit in databases. They're not active there. And very important reason for mishires is because of rush. Oh, I need the guy yesterday, yesterday, we need it today. I mean, where, what were you doing all this time? You knew the guy was leaving. And all of a sudden now that he's, he has already, his, he have given the notice period and he's about to leave in a week, now you're waking up. Come on guys, this is, this is, this process takes time. And uh, you know, you have to have that. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, they have small, small pool of candidates. If you have a small, small pool of candidates, it's very difficult for you to get you know, good candidates. And the reason we are, you, a lot of people have a small pool of candidates because they overemphasize on industry expertise, local experience and nationalities. You know, guys, try your best, unless it's a must, don't make it a must. Like I'll give you an example. If you're looking for an operation guy within an oil and gas, you know, are you looking for a production manager for a petrochemical? Yes, you 100% need somebody from that industry. And I, you know, but other than that, there are so many functions like HR I recruit for, and the guy said we need an ex we need we need him to for, come from our industry. Finance manager, all of these functions are cross industry. Be open because the more you have, the bigger pool, the better chance of you getting the candidate, uh, the the A player candidate. People jump to conclusion too fast. Oh, this guy is a job hopper just because he left you know two organization in two years. Look at look at his other organization that he spent five years, seven years with. Don't do, so people are very quick to jump on conclusion. They don't know how to handle the candidate. They don't set the real expectations. So if they're hiring a sales manager, they say, oh, you know what? The, the target is not that big you can achieve. No, make that target hard for him. Tell him upfront that, you know, this is the target and we are not gonna compromise on that. So unless you can deliver on this target, let's not continue. 
So once you've set that expectations, you know, top performer understand that and he can pull or push himself for the position. A lot of us never prepare for interviews, guys. I mean, we know this. This is the biggest sin of assessment. Looking at a CV five minutes before the interview, worst more, during the interview, they have the CV in front of them and they're going through it while the candidate is sitting in front of them. What do you expect? 25% of the success rate. No structure to the interview. They let candidate uh, take them through all the stories they have to say because they're sitting at the back and enjoying the stories. Unless you use a structure and you ask the question and you move on, on you're not going to do a good job. They don't conduct a reference check. Reference check is very, very important. Don't ever hire anybody without reference check. And I would say, be flexible with the salaries, guys. I know, I know, I know. You know, I, I live in this world and I know we have salary range. I know we have salary structure. But remember that we talk about the means to an end. End of the day, what we need is a business growth. If you find a guy who can bring you millions, right, then what does a 5,000 a month or 10,000 a month you know, the difference is going to make. It's like 50,000 a year, right? And then finally, uh, time is getting over. There's a whole list of cognitive biases that we go through that I don't have time to go through. Uh, I've already done, I've already went over. So uh, thank you very much, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you, you learned a few things. I hope you're able to, to have a few takeaways. Uh, from today's session uh, and you enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, we are open to any question, comment, suggestion uh, from anyone and all of you. Please unmute yourself and, 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 and please pose your question. Sorry, just before we get into the Q&A, if everybody could just turn on their videos, we can just take a quick picture for social media and then we can carry on. If that's okay. Okay, guys, let's do that. The party can never end without a selfie. Imran, if you can just stop screen sharing for just one minute. Sure. Can you, can you please, can everybody turn on their videos for a nice picture? Um, so stop sharing your screen. Sure, sorry. Looking sharp, guys. Abdul Khalik, you are here. Faris, looking great, sharp. Mashallah, is always amazing. Ashik from India, Habib, Abdul Kareem. Hi, Abdul Kareem, how are you? Kamal, Rakesh, great to have you guys. Thank you very much for attending the session. Muhammad Ab, yay. Okay, awesome. I'm going to click the picture now. One, two, three. Okay. Cheese, everybody. Is <laughs> thank you so much. Great, great, great. Okay, guys, uh, any question, any comment, any suggestion? Please come forward. Let's have a chat. Let's have a quick chat. Yes, Abdul Khalid, go ahead. Uh, actually, yesterday, really, it was a very nice, nice uh, listening, but I was skipped a little bit because I was a little bit busy, but uh, really the last part uh, where we see the bad hiring process. Okay, so really, you mentioned a very beautiful things that keep me understanding a few more things that I can even make my personal development in that. So regarding the reference check, like you said, the reference check from last, like three companies. So is that important for reference check for last three companies or like, okay, if someone having a very good experience, so we should focus on uh, three reference check or is that okay with one, the last one? See, uh, as, as, we, as we established the hiring, especially with the senior management, Abdul Khalik, this is so, so important, right? This guy yeah. can drive your organization, right? And yep. if there is any information out there that can tell you a little bit more about the person, his personality, his performance, then why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have seen it can cost a million dollars. So talking to at least three companies with where he had the relevant experience, which really help you validate what you have seen in the, in the, in the assessment, in the interview stage, that will, and then you will really build a complete picture. And it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, when you do reference check properly, it's amazing because I always... I always, you know, for example, I interviewed one guy, he was in automotive, he was that, uh, and in an interview, he said, you know, I always, you know, I go to the floor and I personally write thank you notes to, uh, to, to my sales rep in, in the showrooms, right? 
So you know what I did? I pick up the phone and I call one of those companies in one of the showrooms. I Google from the Google, I pull out the number and I call. Uh, and if I remember, his name was Mark. I just I call the guy, call the company showroom, and, and I said, "Hey, you know, I'm not here to buy buy any car, so don't don't get excited." But uh, there was this gentleman who used to work with your organization. His name is Mark. What do you think about it? And this guy said, "Oh my God, Mr. Imran, this guy was you know we had the best time of our career with this guy." He came up with a commission scheme, uh, and you know he gave us the motivation, the training. Uh, it was one of the best times of our time. I'm mean, just imagine now. I'm just validating what I have learned from this guy during his interview and assessment, and I'm I'm getting more and more solid uh, on this candidate. So reference check is a huge lost opportunity. Uh, talk to three people. Talk to five people. You know. Hey, great, uh, great, really, yeah. it's it's a very great, great thing. No, no, like okay, we can we can do that. So just for information, for this particular guy, he was coming from an automotive. What I did is I talked to his boss, I talked to the HR guy, I talked to this guy in the showroom, mm -hmm. and he was he said also that he was managing partnership with Dubai. So I also called Dubai uh, because he was he was managing that partnership for the brand, and I asked this guy about this guy. Mm -hmm. So there's the information is out there. So why not why why make a guess? Why not you know so that we can make a confident. Uh, decision of such an important decision yeah yeah for sure if now it can be a great percentage in successful hiring absolutely. so that's okay absolutely thank you thank you mr imran imran if i may ask please abdul karim yeah first of all thank you so much for a very informative uh, presentation really it was extremely uh, uh, good and very well structured so thank you so much for that um, my question is related to the fact that you know, um, looking at the candidates, and if you are going to group them into uh, generations, you have generation X, Y, and Z. And, and most of the time, the ones who are really driving the growth are the ones who are relatively young. Those people are being assessed or interviewed by uh, the ones who belong to a different generation and might have a different thinking style. Now, the question is, is, is what can we do about it? How can we overcome this challenge? Wow, what a, what a, what a question. <laughs> uh, my God, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the answer is very simple. We have to get rid of all the, all, all the, all the general, you know, all the general thoughts that we have in our mind, you know, it's like, the thing that we have about the nationalities, right? We have these preconceived notions about the person, the way he looks, and you know, these, it's really all about, if when you go into an interview, you really have to keep, keep your judge, the judge you behind, and you are there as a researcher to get the information. You know, once you go into that mode, which is very difficult, I, I tell you it's very difficult. I didn't go into cognitive biases, which was the last slide, these are the psychological factor that is affecting us that we have no clue about. And marketeers are using these cognitive biases to influence our decision-making thing. Because we like to know, you know, if somebody has, for example, if somebody is, you know, is from Jeddah or somebody is from my city or somebody has studied in Turkey where I studied, oh my God, this guy's great. <laughs> yeah. You know, so these kind of biases, and, and, and really it affects if you are really keen on getting your higher success rate and if you're serious about it, then you really, what you do is you, you just collect the information, you don't react to it, not externally, not internally. And then once you have all that information, then you sit and you try to really, then you judge uh, and try to, you know, hold the judgment as much as possible. Somebody else who have the better answer, please go ahead. Yes, Rakesh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Thanks for the fantastic presentation, Imran. And I'm just adding on to what Mr. Abdul Karim just raised. See, I have always seen, uh, especially in the sales job, you might find an A performer as a good salesperson, a salesman. He works in a company for five to 10 years, and then he expects to be promoted to a sales manager where he might not be a sales performer. Okay. Now, uh, that's the first part. So how do we handle that? Because that also affects the motivation because the company management will be considered as someone who's not benevolent towards people who have put long years of work in the company. Expecting like in a government job where your seniority goes based on your number of years of work experience. In the industry as a HR professional, how do you handle such things, both in terms of motivating the employee to continue to be a good A-performing salesperson 
vis-a-vis -vis not giving him the promotion as a sales manager just because he's put so many years of a performance in his lower job so how do you uh, how do you answer those questions to a management excellent excellent question it's it's so true just because somebody is a top salesman it doesn't necessarily mean that he will be a top sales manager so uh, an a player a player salesman can be really a c player sales manager and that's what it's all about sometimes you know people are in different roles if you just put them in the right role they are an a player and if you put them in some other roles the same guy can be a c player right so you know again you know when when there is a salesman what you do is first of all as an organization it's your responsibility and once you hire and you did and you did a psychometric assessment for this guy right and if you do a good interview now you have a lot of information about this person you know his strength you know his weaknesses uh, and for him to and and an assessment it tells you about his leadership style as well and if you know this guy is low then as an organization uh, you know you have to decide if you want to you know if you want to promote if you want to develop them slowly and surely towards that role because end of the day you know that's how it is right this is this is the nature of life you know people has to move up uh and eventually you know the ceo retires right so that's how the organization go it has fact is not everybody is meant to be a leader and not everybody is meant to be a manager so if you have this kind of person and you know <laughs> i know organization uh, a german organization and the guy is my god rakesh this guy is one of their top salesmen and he this guy in management and leadership he is he couldn't be worse right so what happened in that situation they had a they had a discussion with this guy said listen you know your career is more towards so i think you know develop the guy and at least give him an opportunity you know to be a manager right because sometimes uh, you know as a human being we only know, know how good or bad we are when we when we exercise so i think you know if the guy is with the five years doing great at least he deserve a chance to 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 be a manager so give them an opportunity prepare him well give them an opportunity and then have a and if he's not doing well then have a have a one to one talk with him and say listen you know not everybody there are two tracks in life you can take the technical track and you can really do good because you know for example in a company like pepsi the sales people are make hell of a money so you know so you you keep on going on your technical perhaps the management is not for you yet but also that brings me a very important point that i had in mind which was uh, i think it's related to abdul karim now you also have to be cognizant about how the people are changing now for example in sales role in 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 the in the good old days you really wanted somebody who's extreme on extrovert because there was a lot of knocking door physically there's a lot of cold calling right nowadays with with linkedin on all the social media what i what i'm noticing is the introvert are becoming more successful and there are some studies in harvard and you know harvard business review that you will see that the new successful sales people are interesting in their introvert because there is no more need so that is also you have to be cognizant so imagine you don't understand this and you just keep on oh this guy is not extrovert out 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 so nowadays you know with and also there is a psyche that you know the world is 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 kind of tired of these hard hitting sales people so whenever there is an introvert who is not selling himself hard people get more comfortable to, talking to him so again it's all about the preconceived notion we have in our mind you have to go in every discussion with open mind yeah i'm ron if i may just comment Please. um you know i i think um, you know a few years back uh, uh, the uh, the structure the way we operate the, the formula of success if you wish for our own uh, businesses uh, is more or less predictable now uh, during these years and the uh, years to come the predictability is becoming less and less visibility is becoming less and less and the the, the norm is basically the change very fast change and i think you know while you might recruit people today for the current need you know can they be flexible enough and uh, and innovative enough to accommodate future changes that we might come across so i think maybe part of the hiring is you might need to consider that the ones that you will be recruiting are flexible innovative and they are digital savvy uh, you know uh, and and they understand or they accept or embrace change as they come uh, i i think this is becoming a norm now uh, do you agree with this excellent point excellent point and i would i would what i would suggest is whenever you hire abdul karim focus on people who are high on learn learning agility yeah 
people who are high on learning agility, you will find that they are not hard-headed, they are flexible, uh, and, and it can tell you, you know, when you ask a candidate about, you know, the how many books he read, uh, how many courses he has taken, that will tell you a person who is really hungry for learn. And I think those, so, and also to be honest, there was a, there was a study done by Luminger that says that if, there's one thing, you know, for a CEO, there are a lot of competencies, they say 12, whatever, but the most important competency for CEO is learning agility. Because he's there, he learn about the company, he learn about the competition, he learn about the economy, he learn about the opportunity. So that learning agility, I think whenever somebody is flexible, he's high on learning. That will be a good indicator, but excellent, excellent point, really. Any other question, uh, comments? Hi, hi, Imran, uh, this is Mercy. Hey, Mercy. Happy to have you back. Same here. Um, I just want to um, comment to what um, uh, I can't uh, recollect his name. But he spoke about a sales person that has been in an, uh, in, a, in an office for like five to 10 years in the job. And he's expecting um, to be promoted to a sales manager. And it's yep. not happening for him and all that. I um and uh, let's you you made a very strong comment that maybe you know leadership role isn't for him. Probably the uh, organization has discovered that, but he hasn't come to the realization that leadership role isn't for him. For such a person, I would suggest creating a distinct role for him. What can he do? Can he mentor? Can he coach? He needs, what he's looking for is a sense of belonging that he is in charge of something. It's not necessarily manager or director, but he wants to be in charge of something. If, if he doesn't feel relevant, the next option or the next coach is gonna get out there, he's going to leave. And the, especially if the organization knows that this guy, he's one of their best salesperson. He's a great contributor to the organization. They don't want him to leave. The only way to keep him there, in my own opinion, is create a distinct role for him. If, you, uh, if it's a, an organization that hires, let's say, quarterly or twice a year, they hire a new sales team. And you know that he's got this, good zeal, you know, he can sell, he's the top performer. Maybe you just uh, make him in charge of maybe the mentorship, coaching, shadowing something. But in order to keep him there, he needs to feel relevant. Telling him leadership is not for him, he's going to demotivate him and he's going to leave. This is my own opinion. Excellent, excellent, I love it, I love it, I love that. Uh, to, to create distinct and unique uh, position for people, I'm all for it. You know, a traditional organization structure and, and job title and all of that, it really put us, put us in the box. And I really love that idea that, you know, hey, create something for this guy. Uh, um, Tausi, on, sir. go ahead, Mark. Yes, so uh, we are uh, really uh, <laughs> way overboard and we need to you know, wrap it up soon. <laughs> We, we want to keep on talking while you're bothering us, man. Okay, let me let me hear from Tausi Taus, Taus, Pot. Uh, Tausi, would you like to make any comment, uh, any, any question? Uh, we, we are here to learn from you as well. Please. Sorry, uh, can you unmute yourself, please? So sorry. So sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Thank no you, Mr. Imran, for your offer. Just uh, let me share with you. I, I totally agree with you on the cause of a, of a mishire. If you don't mind, with your permission, I'd like to share a screen with you. Can I share a screen? Yes, please. Why not? Okay, guys. I have a simple chart here. Some of you may agree or you may not agree. We start with ground zero where the employee an employee resigns and you have to replace him. These are the steps. Some of the steps may vary in de depending on your company. You can take a screenshot of this. Uh, normally it will go, typically it will go by notifying the employee uh, HR department. They come up with an advertisement and the advertisement may stay. I've come up here with a timeline. Uh, minimum 30 days for a maximum 45 days. 
then the shortlisting process, the call for interviews, interview shortlist, finalize, finalize the interview. All these would roughly take about 83 days if you are fast. You may be faster than that, it may be, it may be about slightly uh, shorter, but if you work slow, it may take up to 100 over days. And once you finalize, you the candidate serves notice and he joins you three months later or six months later. And the yeah. probation may be three months or six months. Once you make a wrong hire, this is the disruption is going to cause to your company. Okay. The interview process itself is going to take 83 days, which is about three months. And by the time he joins your company, it's already six months. And by the time he completes his probation, it will be nine months. Nine months of salary down the drain. Imagine that candidate is uh, you're paying him five thousand dollars, whatever your country's denomination is. You have thrown, you have blown away forty five thousand uh, dollars uh, cost down the drain with no productivity at all. But if you are slow, then if you look at it, one hundred and sixty one days is is roughly about five months. Five months plus twelve months here is seventeen months. I've calculated fastest you're going to blow thirteen months salary. If you are slow, you're going to blow up. 26 months salary. This is just a time a, a chart that I normally I share with people. You can analyze for yourself. Just now Imran said about the, 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 the money part of it. Now I'm talking about the time part of it. You blow up 26 months of your time, precious time, bringing in somebody with no productivity at all. Back to you, Mr. Amran. Lovely, lovely, Amran. lovely. Thank you so much, Sal. That was amazing. I, I, you know, I always believe that time is not equal to money. Time is more precious than money. Uh, great, great share, Tao. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed it the way as much as we did. Uh, and please stay in touch. Uh, and and see you, see you next time. Thank you, Mr. Imran. Have a lovely day. Thank you so much. Right. You too, guys. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and, and Nitika. Thank you so much. Really appreciate for arranging this for us. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks, Imran. All right. Thank Have you. Bye-bye.